language. All right, now I'm just going to take a deep breath. And once again, welcome everyone who's tuning in. It's been a minute. Um, as you recall, I think uh, we had a very active June, um, and I'll get, in that, I'll get into that in a hot minute, where we were streaming like two, three times a week uh, for the majority of June. Uh, and then uh, we decided to take a bit of a summer break, uh, just relax. Uh, we had launched some products, and uh, now we are absolutely back. And in fact, we're looking forward to it. It's going to be, uh, again, a bit of a busy period, busy fall. Uh, we have a lot of plans um, set up, and uh, we'll get into that in a hot minute. But what I do want to do is um, really start to discuss what we're going to talk about today. So if you want to give me a hot second, I'm actually sharing some slides today. So um, allow me this moment to do so. Uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And here we are. We uh, today are going to talk about e-commerce. Um, and uh, obviously, with respect to performance implications, user experience, et cetera, et cetera. And with us uh, today, we have uh, our, an esteemed guest, Erwin. Uh, we'll introduce him in a hot minute. But this is something that uh, we've been uh, sort of discussing internally for the last little while. And this is something that we do want to cover uh, moving forward as well, making sure that we do talk about e-commerce, which is obviously very important. Um, and I actually love this part of the year uh, as we come close to uh, back to school, what I like to call the other new year. Uh, but back to school is always a very important um, area when it comes to commerce. And obviously, anything commerce related in 2022 moving forward uh, is going to be um, also accompanied with uh, the idea of uh, e-commerce. So we'll get into uh, the specifics there in a hot minute. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about, oh, terribly sorry, there we go. One thing I do want to talk about, uh, like I said uh, earlier in this introduction, is that uh, we spent uh, a very busy June talking about what? Well, WebPage tests and specifically um, some of the new features uh, that we introduced uh, to uh, the incredible tool and platform that is WebPage test. And um, man, I, I, I could spend an entire hour discussing what it was, but you know, opportunities or what they were, pardon me, opportunities and experiments. Um, Shout out to the Eng team. They did a fantastic job uh, sort of launching this. Uh, but if you are very curious, obviously, um, I'd recommend that. Hold on a quick second. Uh, that you try it out. First of all, if you go to webpagetest.org, if you don't have an account, definitely get one. They're free. Um, and uh, a lot of great opportunities and features uh, that are already present in the tool just by having a free account. And then if you ever move on to a paid pro account, you'll see uh, there are tons more available. Uh, but if you're not familiar, um, you should definitely move over to the uh, web page test uh, channel that we have on YouTube. If you go to bit.ly slash channel dash WPT, standing for web page test, we recorded all of the uh, 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 presentations that we had uh, during uh, the month of June, sort of like introducing a lot of the new features that we added. Um, again, I mentioned the opportunities and experiments. So definitely go down there if you're very curious, which you should be. Um, and um, moving forward, um, I also want to mention, like I said, the channel that we have. And you can see... Um, a lot of the recordings there from June. And as well, we have previous recordings that you can also watch if you're not familiar with web page tests at all. Uh, and we're going to be adding some more, a lot more actually this fall. So definitely stay tuned for that. And um, if you're not subscribed, uh, hit the formerly red button that said subscribe, that says subscribed. It's uh, kind of a dark gray there because I am subscribed to my own channel. Um, yeah. So, something else that I do like to mention is uh, Web Page Test Live is something that we try to do at least twice a month, uh, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but we'll try to keep it at least two editions uh, a month, um, spaced, spaced out by two weeks. 
something that we are going to be doing, and uh, we tweeted this out some time back, is that we're actually going to be featuring um, people, well, cases that have been picked up by the community because we realize that a lot of the users uh, of WebHS like to sort of, you know, look under the hood and, and you know, look at random sites to see if they're performing or not or see if they uh, employ best practices. So if you ever do want to submit um, something that you saw personally that was fairly interesting, um, if you go to bit.ly slash WPT dash submission, and it'll take you to a form where you could actually uh, share the uh, uh, the URL, the web page test URL, because they are shareable. And, uh, you know, give us a little insight as to why you thought this site was pretty interesting or had some bizarre behavior or you spotted something that was a little crazy. And uh, we're actually going to collect these and uh, talk about them during our broadcasts. Uh, now, we may not do that today. In fact, we won't. Uh, but we may do it in the next one. I'm not sure. But uh, if you, again, go to bit.ly slash WPT dash submission, uh, we are gladly accepting uh, submissions with uh, some interesting findings because we do this all the time ourselves. Um, and we're, of course, we're going to shout you out uh, for the, uh, the insight. Um, let's move on to something that I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about which are meetups. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, remember going to meetups. It's been a little while. Uh, we do realize that some are starting to uh, basically come back, um, some in person, some virtual, uh, some hybrid, as you like to call them right now. But um, this is something that is personal to me uh, and uh, personal to WebHS as well. Uh, let me explain. Uh, I actually got started in performance really attending meetups. Uh, the Toronto Web Performance Meetup was uh, amazing. Uh, it was led by this uh, amazing uh, woman. Uh, God, what's, what's her last name again? Barbara Burmese. There we go. And um, I really got interested in the, in the space uh, afterwards. Uh, it was always great talks and whatnot. And we realize that uh, the meetup ecosystem means a lot to uh, the developer community, but certainly to the web performance community. And that's without a doubt. Um, I used to attend some whenever I was in the area. If I was traveling, uh, I'd been to the San Francisco one. Uh, I'd been to the London one, uh, both as an attendee and a speaker, believe it or not. Um, but in fact, I used to watch the London one because they were streaming theirs long before the pandemic. Uh, and it was just an amazing experience. Um, and they had fantastic speakers there every time. Long story short, uh, we are going to um, assist anyone who would like to start or sort of uh, maintain a meetup that is already out there. So if you're in a particular city that has a meetup um, and you know you'd like to see them come back in person, let us know. You know we do have a good pulse on the performance meetups that are out there and we've been in touch. and like I said, we are tr doing our best to sort of uh, lift them back up and get things going again, whether it be in person and or virtual. But if you're in a city that you think, could use a performance meetup, definitely let me know. Uh, actually, I'll share my uh, Twitter handle if you want to ping me. Um, pretty active on Twitter, usually pretty responsive as well. But um, this is something, again, that is very important to myself uh, because I do want to see the meetup um, community come back and certainly to WebHS as well because we do believe that there's absolute worth in having a good ecosystem of meetups out there because you could learn so much from it. Um, you could attend uh, talks that may not happen uh, quite often. Uh, and, you know, there are other opportunities that come from attending a meetup in general and certainly a web performance meetup. So um, if you do have any interest in starting one up, please, uh, I uh, insist that you uh, get in touch with me and we'll further the conversation at that point. Um, and speaking of meetups, um, oh, actually, and I do want to mention, well, I'll get back to it actually at the end. I'm terribly sorry about that. Now, speaking of meetups, um, the Toronto Web Performance Meetup, the one that I mentioned earlier, um, was on a bit of a hiatus, you know, but uh, 
like I said, fall seems to just bring back so many good things like conferences, et cetera, et cetera, and meetups and, you know, everything that's, that's about sort of like, you know, uh, ending the holidays. So that being said, the Toronto Web Performance Meetup um, has announced uh, their next meetup, which is going to be August 2nd, uh, Tuesday next week. We have Steve from Builder.io and Alon from Wix. Um, the good people at Builder.io have been doing uh, some considerable work, very big supporters of all things sort of web performance. Uh, so they're going to come uh, and share with us in virtual, so online, uh, automating performance at scale. And uh, Alon, who's at Wix, uh, performance engineer there, they have been doing fantastic work the last couple of years, and he's going to come talk about that and specifically placing performance at the front uh, when it comes to Wix and their platform. So um, definitely come by and check that out. Uh, if you're interested, um, here's a link, uh, bit.ly slash T-O-W-P, so T Toronto Webperf dash August 2nd, A-U-G-0-2. Um, and you can RSVP there. It's going to be, if you're on the East Coast, it's going to be slightly early, so 11 in the morning. If you're on the West Coast, it's going to be extremely early, terribly sorry, 8 a.m. Um, but that's also because we're trying to accommodate uh, two time zones, Israel and the West Coast, all in one. Pretty amazing. That's the uh, feature that you can get out of having uh, a online and virtual event. So definitely chum, uh, come check that out if you can. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it myself. And uh, so we talked about meetups and I slightly mentioned uh, conferences. So I do want to mention this particular conference right here. This is performance.now or perf now as we like to call it. Uh, it's a web performance conference. Uh, came about, I believe the first year might have been 2019, maybe um, 2018 uh, as well, but definitely 2019. Um, I was there, spoke there in fact, but um, they're back and uh, for two years uh, they were, you know, unable to be in person. Um, they decided to skip the virtual component of or the virtual opportunities of a uh, conference, but they're back in person. Um, the performance community is absolutely excited. And I think it was manifested when they pretty much sold out of their early birds. Um, I think last I checked, like a week and a half ago, they had like two early bird tickets left. Uh, they're running, uh, they're selling very fast. So um, if you're in Europe, I think this is a must attend personally. Uh, it's going to be uh, in Amsterdam, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm hearing rumors that large teams are going. So this is going to be super duper interesting. Of course, WebPHS is going to be there. Uh, myself and actually many members of the team, uh, Eng team uh, uh, from America and Europe as well. So if you have any questions, definitely come by and check us out. Um, I mean, a bit of an early announcement, but we're going to be doing something there as well the night before the conference. So the, uh, the conference is the 27th and 28th. Look for something from us um, with the community on the 26th, I believe. So we'll break out the details about that a little um, in um, some time. So, um, yes, perf.now, performance.now. Get your tickets. It's going to be a great time. Like I said, uh, you're going to meet um, many members of the uh, performance community who just generally know each other from uh, being online. Uh, but we're going to be there in person. And as I close uh, my deck, um, and you know, we are going to now move from uh, talking about performance.now and uh, the Netherlands to a guest who is from the Netherlands. Uh, and, you know, I am delighted, overjoyed. Please put your hands together. Welcome, <laughs> my man, Erwin Hoffman. <sighs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, I have to bring in some uh, applause, um, you know, some sound effects or something like that, because I think it'll be a lot better. You, you don't uh, have a soundboard yet, or? I mean, it's not connected. You know, there's oh, too okay. much stuff here. If I could, you know, if I had to show you everything, it'd be a separate <laughs> show. Uh, but uh, that being said, first of all, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for taking some time 
uh, out of your day to um, jump on a stream with us. Uh, we are absolutely looking forward to it. But enough about that. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself, Erwin. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, my name is in the screen already. It's uh, in Dutch, it's uh, Erwin Hoffman, or in English, it's just Erwin Hoffman. I think that's more convenient. Um, and um, yeah, I, um, I've been in web development since I think 2001. Um, rolled into also web performance, um, but even, yeah, you know, even web performance has its own, uh, well, nuances and niches, sub-niches maybe. Um, but um, yeah, as a consultant, I'm helping both agencies as well as uh, merchants as well. Awesome. And, yeah. um, you know, when you said you've been in development since 2001 and you obviously eventually progressed to um, web performance, like what was the moment where you made that sort of switch? Um, I think, well, I once started, it was back in 2000 and I think two or maybe three that I started off with, well, building my own CMS. Mm -hmm. Not because I wasn't stubborn. I mean, that phase came a bit later, but um, because, yeah, WordPress did exist back then, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't hear about it by then and then started creating my own CMS um, because I got all kinds of questions to edit this text and that page, etc. And I just wanted to do development instead of, well, also being responsible for writing text or changing texts. Um, so that's why I created my own CMS, and um, I guess that's where my learnings are coming from as well. Best practices when it comes to accessibility and also uh, performance. Um, and it, um, well, yeah, it took a long, a lot of time, uh, a lot of years before I started to well also share my my well learnings and, uh, and knowledge. Um, I think it's it was about 2015. Um, so yeah, that was the year around 2015 that I actually started to share it with other agencies, which maybe felt a bit weird because I also started my own agency along the way with developers, etc. Um, but um, so yeah, it felt maybe a bit like cheating, but it also opened just like well, uh, yeah, um, organizing meetups. Um, you know, you also get to know other people out in the field, etc. Yeah and get to share, um, well, once again, findings and knowledge and, yeah. Exactly, and you kind of hear about, you know, the pain points and, and things like that and, and their discussions as you're sort of like, you know, um, actively like listening to what they're saying. And, you know, so someone who, I, you know, started in 2001 and is now, again, uh, with full agencies, you've seen these sort of transitions take place. Uh, that's correct, yeah. You know, so like once upon a time, say, you know, we were just busy sort of being on our computers and desktops and suddenly, you know, we went to mobile and now we even forgot what a desktop was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And also the kind of frameworks, it's really going fast, all the developments, especially within the frameworks. Um, for example, well, yeah, React first being client-side, still client-side, but then also coming up with a server-side rendering solution which then also has its own challenges once again, et cetera. Uh, but it's really going fast in the, in the last few years. That's for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that is, once again, the, the, the nature of, say, in the, the performance, web performance business. Um, you know, we, well, you know, to an extent, we kind of, you know, we have to keep our ear to the ground, see what people are talking about. And often enough, it goes from talking about to being sort of, you know, experimented or used and suddenly, you know, showing up in production. So you have to be familiar to an extent um, to, with what people are doing and, 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 and sort of presenting and, and trying to execute as well. You know, so uh, it, it makes for a very kind of like challenging uh, climate and particularly environment, if that's um, if I could say that. Um, you know, before we get, you know, uh, into sort of like the, the weeds of what we're going to talk about today and what we're going to do, um, how would you classify, and, you know, if for anyone who's not aware, we're going to talk about e-commerce, um, how would you classify the importance of the e-commerce uh, ecosystem or business in general right now? You mean the importance of performance within e-commerce or? 
Yeah, to an extent, you know, e-commerce, uh, just generally how it sort of stands in terms of its importance. And obviously, mm -hmm. we'll get into the performance a bit uh, afterwards. Okay. Uh, but what are you asking me now? The so, you know, um, do, do you find like the conversation about e-commerce is very much prevalent? Like it, it comes up a lot? Uh, well, yeah, I'm I'm often involved with e-commerce only. So, uh, yeah, within my space, uh, it's yeah only e-commerce. Um, and yeah, if you're asking or talking about the differences between um, e-commerce and non-e-commerce, well, I, I guess it's um, it makes sense that um, well, yeah, optimizing your shop um, does lead to improved conversion, improved bounce rate. Um, so yeah, you know, th that's also why I rolled into the e-commerce space because um, they know it has impact on their conversion and as a result, they are more likely to, well, spend money to improve performance and um, yeah, maybe also accessibility, but performance, and, uh, unlike privacy, it, it speaks more to the mind that it will also Im actively impact your conversion while, well, it doesn't really apply to accessibility, for example, or people tend to think it doesn't apply to accessibility and, and privacy, which is a shame. But um, um, yeah, so in that sense, it's a, it's different than um, uh, non-e-commerce sites. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so how about we do this? Um, you know, on a web page test live, uh, as you know, uh, many who are potentially watching and who are familiar with our platform, uh, what we like to do is invite guests and have them sort of like walk through uh, their typical day. You know, so uh, they wake up in the morning and, you know, they have a list of, of clients, uh, client work to sort of tackle, uh, cases, whatever it may be. And, you know, they pour themselves a cup of coffee, put on a nice white shirt, have a nice sip of coffee like you just did, Erwin. And uh, yeah, oh, oh, tea. There we go. And, um, you know, the coffee's for us, the Mannix, you know, they're like, ah. And, um, and yeah, you know, and then you sit down at your computer and you sort of, you know, start your process of, uh, you know, looking at a, a, a client's request uh, for a sort of like an audit to see what exactly is going on. So um, that's what we're going to do today, folks. You know, we are going to sit down and watch Erwin sort of go through his typical workday workflow, uh, the tools he uses, obviously, you know, using web page tests and, and look at what it's like to sort of, you know, look for the challenges or do an audit um, in the e-commerce space uh, when it comes to performance. So that being said, I'm going to uh, get my cup of coffee ready. I'm passing you the keys, Erwin. And I okay. believe you have sharing privileges and yep. the stage is entirely yours. All right. Let's see if I'm able to uh, share my screen going over here. Uh, do I have two screens? Yes, I do. All right. And there we go. A bit of, um, all right, inception. Okay. Yeah. This um, is so I, th I think this actually already is a, a common tool. Well, maybe just in our space. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I learned about the Trio because of Harry Roberts, which uh, was also using Trio a lot as far as I'm picking up on Twitter and previous uh, web page test live sessions. Um, I, well, when it comes to drinks, I'm, I've been told I'm not a typical developer because um, I'm not drinking coffee actually. Um, but I do often work quite late in the, well, into the night. Um, and um, well, yeah, it basically helps me to focus a bit way more. Um, and um, when I'm getting a new, well, yeah, request for doing a performance audit, then um, obviously I want to know what I'm, what I'm about to work with. Um, so one of the first things I do is, uh, well, checking public data, obviously, because, well, it doesn't, uh, yeah, cost a lot of time to get public data out of uh, the Crux database. Um, because, well, yeah, Trio is just, uh, you could say, a smart tool around the Crux database. And uh, what I'm using as well, obviously, is uh, PageFeed Insights because, um, well, PageFeed Insights is giving slightly more nuance, for example, let's put this in by going to PageFeed Insights. Um, so it's giving me a little bit more nuance than, for example, um, a trio because, well, this is uh, data per month, per month for the whole origin. 
and obviously I can pick both uh, phone or desktop, desktop or tablet or basically all, but I often switch to phone right away because, well, yeah, we all know, I guess, that, that desktop tends to be better anyway. Um, and for example, when looking over here, it's in uh, touch, but let's translate it. If I'm able to translate, yeah. There we go. All right. Um, by checking, well, I don't have any data, so let's use a different URL. For example, one of the URLs we're going to discuss today. All right. So this webshop has a sufficient amount of data for both the home page as well as the whole Orange summary, which makes sense if you have sufficient amount of data for the home page. Um, and I am then able to spot maybe any uh, differences between, well, basically the home page and maybe over overall data. So let's see if we are able to see the same over here. Um, so in this case, um, one of the first metrics, well, yeah, obviously in the end, I will be looking at all of these metrics. Um, but um, I start with looking at the type first byte, FTP, and also the large control panes, um, because those are also telling me something about, well, the amount of work between when the browser received the first bytes of HTML and when the browser was able to, uh, well, yeah, paint the first pixels to the screen. And then when often, especially within e-commerce, when the largest image was um, downloaded and shown, um, and by then, comparing the home page with the origin summary, I may be able to tell that, that well, apparently um, the home page has a higher time to first byte. So this then means that the home page is also part of the origin summary. Uh, so overall, other pages are actually better, performing better when it comes to time to first byte than the home page. Although I should add that um, it is still missing some nuances. Um, for example, I'm not able to tell if the time first byte or the better FCP, slightly better, slightly better FCP on the origin summary, so slightly worse on the home page. Um, I'm not, I'm not able to tell if this is caused by a lot of unique visitors page views, or maybe, it's, um, well, maybe it still has a lot of successive page views as well, but just a bigger bottleneck on the home page. So those are nuances that I'm missing over here. Mm -hmm. um, that's also something I often use to, yeah, basically to describe and illustrate that it's really about real users. So yeah, we could look at the lab data, but in the end, um, well, yeah, it's been said before in different sessions as well. Um, this is being tested under fixed conditions. Mm -hmm. And um, well, yeah, your users, no user is the same. So one user might be on a, a, a fast phone, but um, maybe slow internet connection or the other way around or a combination of the two, or well, there are even more combinations than just those two. Mm -hmm. um, so those nuances are obviously missing in this data. And what I'm then often using to illustrate that it's really about real, real users is uh, by describing that, um, well, um, low device memory phones might be having a worse experience, especially the more that JavaScript you're using, the bigger the impact on user experience, especially the responsiveness. Um, and what I'm then using as an example is if you've got an electrical bike of maybe, I don't know, $2,000, which nowadays is the same as uh, euros, mm -hmm. um, people might tend to use better devices when searching for products with a higher price. So yeah, if you've got both cheap products and also uh, expensive products, then the expensive product might actually have way better data while the template is and the stack is completely the same as maybe the product page with, uh, with a, a cheap uh, product. Um, so that's why, what I'm often using as well as an example to well illustrate how it's really about real users. And um, I should add, obviously, that this is also based on real user data, um, which is already quite convenient because if you don't have any real user monitoring going on yourselves, um, then you basically get real user data for free already by mm -hmm. you know, both looking at uh, PageSpeed Insights or Trio or, um, well, yeah, maybe other toolings that are... Um, well, maybe using the API of uh, Crux. Yeah, run-based. Um, here's a quick question. So 
these these are your very first steps and um i've always said and you know many uh, around uh will will sort of uh echo this um quite often enough you can um notice patterns right um whether great patterns or poor patterns you know and at this point in your early sort of like investigation um do you ever see uh, is there a particular pattern that you see quite often or is it just really just very random like you don't really uh, notice any patterns that may lead you in a particular direction um it is well yeah i wouldn't say quite random because in the end maybe most platforms do have the same challenges um but even when i'm dealing with the same well yeah platform as the week before for example then um, i guess about well yeah it, it varies between 40 and 60 percent of case specific challenges maybe because an agency or merchant um use their own layer or theme on top of the platform uh, introduced um, a b testing or uh, other third parties going on um, so yeah as a result um, well yeah about 40 to 60 percent might be the same platform but um, um, they still often have their own challenges as well yeah go ahead please okay yeah i wanted to say that i'm well yeah when it comes to the browser dealing with your source code um, the browser doesn't really care about the platform that you're using, obviously. Um, I mean, in the end, it's all uh, HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Um, and yeah, the, the same, as a result, the same applies to uh, performance testing as well. Um, so yeah, I'm dealing with different platforms, Shopify, Lightspeed, Magento, uh, Shopware, um, also React and uh, Next.js, for example. So um, yeah, as a result, especially within um, well, what I'm doing on a daily basis, um, challenges really varies. Yeah, understood. Understood. Yeah, and and you know, again, I, I mentioned that because sometimes, um, and I know I, I've I've sort of called his name out a few times about this because I remember he mentioned it on a podcast, and it was Andy Davies who said that you know you actually start to recognize patterns, you know, in particular cases. And but you know, even though this was quite some time ago, and I don't even know if React was around at the time when you mentioned that, or, or the sort of proliferation of frameworks, JavaScript frameworks, anyways. Uh, but um, he was very adamant in saying, like, you know, once you've looked at a lot of stuff, you know, patterns develop, and you can kind of start to make some judgment calls at that point. That point. But mm -hmm. uh, good to know. So now that you've done that, you've started your sort of process. You know, what are the next steps in your in your sort of workflow? Um, that's where, um, well, web page test comes in as well. Um, so let's uh, once again share my screen. Mm, there we go. All right. Um, and I'm basically, when, when checking web, well, let's get rid of the inception here. So um, when uh, diving into web page test at the same time, I'll also be opening, uh, well, yeah, a few source. So I'll be navigating to the website itself at the same time. Um, to basically confirm what I'm seeing in web page test and also the other way around. Um, so there we go. I'm not sure why they are, they think they need to do this or maybe it's their platform, I don't know. But um, yeah, so I basically both look at um, um, web page test and the source code as well. And you, well, one question could be why am I not looking at, for example, uh, Chrome DevTools itself, because it already has the same feature. Um, but I have to say that, um, yeah, web page just really makes it easy to, uh, well, yeah, look at it in a, in a glimpse and uh, already catch some anti-patterns or other things going on. Mm -hmm. um, so I I think web page just is way easier uh, to the eye to read, I guess, uh, than, uh, than DevTools. Um, but as soon as I really need to dive in, that's where uh, DevTools is coming in. Uh, but yeah, as a matter of fact, when scrolling to the bottom, um, web page test is already enabling yeah, enabling me to tell where work is done on the main thread mm -hmm. and when it's about to become an issue. Um, so yeah, it's, it is a lot of information, obviously. I mean, um, there's also one great article written by um, someone working at BCC, if I'm correct, 
Uh, I do know his Twitter handle, uh, but I don't know his name. It's no shoe if I'm correct. But, oh, yeah, uh, um, Matt. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, Matt Hobbs is that yes. the name? Yeah. Yes. All right. So he's got a uh, well, yeah, basically a fantastic article um, that uh, that really helps to also dive into uh, a web page that's waterfall. Uh, because, well, you don't get to learn this in one day, obviously, because there is a lot of information. Um, but still, it makes it very convenient to already uh, see some bottlenecks uh, in a glimpse. So, for example, over here, um, we are able to tell that uh, the style sheet is uh, render blocking. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, thanks to this cross at the start of the line, um, indicating that it's a render blocking resource. Um, and for CSS... I mean, yeah, it makes sense because the browser needs the CSS and you could go into, and well, using critical CSS, inlining the CSS in the head, head section in a style block. Um, but it comes with a lot of nuances and might actually introduce um, layout shifts, which is what I'm often seeing. So whenever a party is trying to implement critical CSS because they read about improving the first control paint by getting rid of your render blocking resource. Um, I often see, talking about patterns, I guess this is one of them, or maybe two already, because I often see the following, following things going on, or um, the inline CSS isn't complete, so some styling is missing for maybe a collapsed, um, or well, hidden hamburger menu, or just menu in general, and maybe the, the hero slider. And as soon as the, well, basically external CSS is popping in, jumping in, then, um, well, yeah, you see the navigation jumping around and the uh, contents are pushed, being pushed down because um, some room is needed for the hero image slider. Uh, so that's what I'm often seeing. Uh, or sometimes the CSS is quite complete, but maybe seeing some subtle uh, layout shifts. So yeah, it comes with a lot of uh, nuances to implement critical CSS. And obviously you don't get to benefit from uh, browser caching anymore when implementing critical CSS. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, I'm actually also using on my website, I'm also using critical CSS, but only on the first uh, page it, um, inspired by filament group, uh, I think, .com. Also great website, but uh, with a lot of good examples and code examples as well. Um, but yeah, I only do it on the first page here because otherwise you get to win some, but also get to lose some because you don't get to benefit anymore from browser caching while mm -hmm. your HTML source code becomes bigger. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, source code becoming bigger, bigger might not become a real issue until your both your pages are, well, actually with an e-commerce, HTML can become quite lengthy, quite mm -hmm. uh, large. Um, and some tend to implement all uh, in inline all CSS. So then your head section really well becomes bloated, which might then lead to chunked HTML, for example. We already get to see an example of chunked HTML over here. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is a better example. Let's find out on one of the other. Yeah. So we see different multiple uh, dark uh, blue colored uh, yeah, bars within mm -hmm. the uh, opaque bar. Uh, meaning, yeah, the browser is receiving the HTML in multiple chunks. Mm -hmm. So if some homework for the browser, like yeah, detecting or fact discovering resources wasn't part of the first chunk yet, mm -hmm. then yeah, you risk um, yeah, resources being loaded later on. And if that's your LCP, for example, if that's your LCP candidate, then you are already negatively impacting your LCP. Uh, but yeah, we already, well, going off topic here oh no not not so much you know <laughs> and uh but because again this is part of and you know you may have heard me say this in the past and you know if you haven't i'm going to say it right now uh but you know this is investigative nature you know this is you know uh an engineer this is a consultant this is you know whomever an seo person um looking for these points uh where there's evidence of, you know, I'm not going to say foul play, but uh, a challenge, right? Yeah. So, you know, I want to get back to a few things right now. So you'd mentioned that, um, you know, you're seeing potentially, and actually you could actually keep that page because I, I wouldn't mind going back to uh, to some of the, the things you had mentioned. The, um, the, uh, the URL that you were sharing, the, uh, the screen, 
you yep. want to bring that back up real quick and there i'll just go. yep i'll pop it back up hold up and there we go active stream so you'd mentioned uh that you're seeing layout shifts and so i would imagine do you see poor cls scoring out the gate quite often you know in your in your research um yeah well when when inlining CSS is being used uh, in a critical, well, inline critical CSS strategy, then uh, I often do see um, uh, CLS happening as a result. But um, yeah, it, it might make sense because no e-commerce will be the same. Um, well, what I should say is um, the average e-commerce is doing a lot of deploys, maybe style changes, new features. So yeah, as a result, CSS is also changing. And if it's CSS, uh, responsible for any elements above the fold, for example, then um, you need to keep your um, yeah, inline CSS up to date as well. And while well, you could do so using build tools, for example, um, but um, yeah, at the same time, if you are not using build tools or the build tool isn't able to well collect all needed CSS, then um, yeah, you're basically increasing CLS over time as new features are being added or cell changes, layout changes are being added. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and again, you know, I will um, make the assumption, potentially unjustly, but um, a lot of uh, us uh, web performance aficionado in the audience and listening. But in case you're not, CLS cumulative layout shift is when uh, you'll see some of your resources jumping up and down the page. You know, like they were happy, uh, but meanwhile the user's not happy. Um, and getting back to that other page, I think um, that you had shown uh, with the the multiple dark uh, areas in the HTML download. I don't know if you there it is. Yep. So uh, for anyone who's not very familiar with um, web page tests, so what we have here is a very classic waterfall. Uh, but one of our very early, well, I shouldn't say very early, but one of the features that has been around at web page chess for a little while now is that um, you'll have darker areas of the uh, resource um, load um, in the waterfall that dark area is actually chunks of resources being downloaded at the time so when you see that uh, a particular waterfall has like several chunks of like dark area these are little chunks of data being downloaded, all right? So it kind of gets granular in showing you when exactly parts of that resources uh, that resource are being picked up, you know? Yeah. So which is why, again, Owen uh, mentions like, hey, you can see that the HTML was being downloaded in several parts instead of like one giant sort of, well, not giant, one download, a continuous download. So that could lead to discovery challenges of code, which then will lead to particular resources loading at different parts of the, of the process. I just want to clear that up for people who had been watching and saying like, hey, what's going on here? All right. Um, and a, a second, uh, well, also pattern is um, when critical CSS is being inlined, I often still see people or platforms um, using render blocking and then also parse blocking JavaScript. And um, although I'm not really doing website audits, um, it's especially within WordPress, but also Magento from time to time, where they succeeded in lazy loading the CSS using the media is print workaround um, and then inlining CSS as well in a style block in the head section. Um, but then they are still having, yeah, render blocking JavaScript going on. And once again, within uh, WordPress, it's often the jQuery, which, which then isn't deferred. So they succeeded in implementing critical CSS, deferred all other JavaScript except for the um, jQuery file itself. Um, so yeah, then it doesn't come with any added benefits anymore. As a matter of fact, you only introduce an anti-pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and the same also happens within, I see it happening sometimes in Magento as well, mm -hmm. uh, where the typical required JS is then still run blocking, for example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're talking about patterns, these then are two examples of, uh, of patterns. So here's a quick question for you. Um, we are talking about e-commerce. Uh, we're talking about performance. 
do you uh, find that a lot of your audits or just in general in your travels are are many of your audits or considerable well i guess it would probably make sense if it was but i'll just ask anyways um, do you see a lot of your e-commerce clients on the wordpress platform uh, no, but that's once again because I'm uh, really involved in um, uh, e-commerce uh, environments, solutions. Um, and well, yeah, the difficult part about uh, WordPress or WooCommerce in case of a web shop is um, that, that I think I could say that the typical WordPress or WooCommerce user once started using WordPress because it's uh, quite convenient to start with um, and also a low budget solution to start with. Um, so I guess, yeah, that as a result, I see two things happening. Uh, the first one is a merchant or agency, well, in the end, the merchant, not willing to spend a budget on, on improving performance and use experience and bounce rate and maybe any SEO benefits as well. Mm -hmm. um, and another one, uh, because I've done WordPress in the past, but uh, another challenge is uh, that whenever a new update is uh, or upgrade or whatever is being done, um, any optimizations are being undone. Um, so, yeah, that's quite a challenge within WordPress and uh, within, well, maybe a more mature solution. Uh, mature solution. Um, people then tend to be, developers then tend to be a bit more on top of performance. So once they are acquainted with performance, they are also more likely to keep spending, um, yeah, time and efforts in, in performance optimization. And I'm actually not doing optimizations myself. So I'm basically doing recommendations and also um, guiding them in what the impact will be on, uh, on specific metrics um, indicated by, well, a rating of one to five, for example. Um, and, um, and the advantage is any knowledge or learnings will stay in house. So, for example, when I'm not involved anymore, anything they learned from doing an audit or maybe a training session or a combination, then stays in house. And um, yeah, once again, within WordPress, um, the budget isn't always there to uh, uh, yeah uh, to have both an audit or uh, yeah and or uh, a training session. Mm -hmm. um, so as a result, I'm not doing WordPress anymore, um, or basically websites in general, uh, but especially, um, yeah, e-commerce. Nice, nice, nice. I mean, there's nothing like being able to just make the recommendations, you know, collect your check and leave. <laughs> um, basically, yeah. Hey, I, I'm not mad at that. Um, so here's a quick question and before we sort of like follow up some more. Uh, you know, you just mentioned, you know, metrics and looking at them. Um, are, any, are, are there any particular metrics that you find um, are, again, sort of like indicative of an e-commerce site? Like, is there anything that, again, coming back to a pattern that you're like, oh, I see these metrics doing this. This sounds like it might be e-commerce. No, not in particular. No, mm -hmm. you mean well. Yeah, whenever I'm just uh, checking websites because I'm being curious, even mm -hmm. when it's not e-commerce, for example, I also run into a high high time to first byte, for example. Mm -hmm. So Magento, it's a real ch challenge in the bigger um, e-commerce systems. Mm -hmm. I said Magento, but also in other platforms. Mm -hmm. um, but the same, I could run into the same when looking at a WordPress website as well, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the clients that rendering solutions often have a should have a good time first byte, but then maybe a higher um, first input delay or talking about the new metric, the, the interaction to next paint. Mm -hmm. um, so those those could be examples of typical differences between uh, platforms, and then I might be able to draw some con conclusions already. Mm -hmm. Or for example, when um, the LCP is close to the FCP, then and and both are quite high. Mm -hmm. then chances are that some A-B testing is going on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are patterns in which you are able to recognize, maybe or already being able to recognize what's going on. Um, but obviously, I would still need web page tests and then also diving into the source code to, mm -hmm. um, well, to um, yeah, make a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
here's something else uh, I'd like to ask you. And I don't know if Mike, I think it was, um, I was in his space today and uh, he had mentioned um, a couple of things to me. But um, one of them, I think he had mentioned was um, sort of like uh, add to cart issues, um, things around, you know, the actual process of of getting um, you know, like a typical e-commerce sort of like workflow. Again, you know, customer adding something to cart. Um, do you see that sort of like, uh, is there a sort of anti-pattern in that sort of process that you seek sort of like you, you could pick up and say like a waterfall and or in, in some of the data that you, you analyze? Uh, for user interaction with the add to cart button or? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Well, yeah, with a typical web page test, obviously you don't see any interactions going on mm -hmm. um, and you could use some scripting to uh, mimic uh, such behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I guess the, the um, well, I'm not really seeing any issues in general with add, you know, clicking on add to cart. Mm -hmm. um, although I have seen CLS issues with uh, the add to cart button. Okay. Where for example, the adding to cart is doing an API request um, to have it added to the cart in the database as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, such a request is taking quite a bit of time. And then once um, the API is uh, well coming back with a response, then the user would see a notice or an alert or a mes message, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if, if uh, doing the API call is uh, taking a bit of time, or I should say, uh, coming back with a response is taking a bit of time, then it will also delay, for example, uh, the notice. And if it's a notice that it's sliding in, pushing contents down, then, well, you've got a CLS right there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, so uh, that's, uh, I haven't seen it that often, to be mm -hmm. honest, okay. um, just in a few occasions. Okay, all good. Um, so, Again, you know, getting back to the the sort of like the workflow of your audit, uh, you know, we've seen the very start, and then you start to look at the uh, the waterfalls uh, and whatnot. Are there any other parts of like some features at a web page test, or just in general that you sort of look for as the audit continues? Like, do do you have sort of like a, a start, like which we saw, um, and a sort of like a meaty middle uh, before you start to make your conclusions? Um. Well, yeah, I then often, for example, I can see multiple uh, uh, files, resources being downloaded at the same time. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, it's also coming back with a response. Once again, the darker color, mm -hmm. uh, it's also coming back with a response at the same time. So that's also in, already an indication that um, HTTP2 might be used mm -hmm. um, and they are well sh sharing the same stream. Mm -hmm. um, once again, a lot of information over here, but uh, in this case, um, I'm able to tell by looking at this number and then, well, chances are this is uh, then number nine, uh, not to be confused with the number at the first row. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, uh, chances are that a lot of files are being downloaded at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. And then they are basically also competing with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so what I find is interesting over here is um, multiple files being downloaded at the same time um, while chances are that they aren't all as important mm -hmm. um, obviously css is and some fonts you want to be you want the fonts to be there quite soon to prevent any font layout shifts um, but at the same time for icons being preloaded i well looking at the source code uh, looking at the waterfall chances are that these are being preloaded mm -hmm. but chances also are that um, you don't really need to preload for so i would then say look at the type of fonts that are needed above the fold mm -hmm. and maybe give other fonts a lower priority. Um, so what I'm seeing over here, what's interesting to see is uh, there's a group of uh, a few important files, apparently, and then uh, these are being downloaded way later. So um, that, there's quite a gap over here. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be something to dive in a bit more. Um, and well, yeah, you know, if I'm curious, then um, I'll just continue my, my auditing process already, even if there is not a collaboration yet. Yeah. Um, and uh, sometimes, um, well, yeah, it obviously then just becomes part of the collaboration to dive in more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm seeing over here. And in this case, uh, well, this file is also interesting. Um, they 
uh, well, yeah, it's uh, used for A-B testing optimizedly. Mm -hmm. um, and well, yeah, it's a quite common uh, discussion, I guess. Um, Andy Davis also wrote an interesting uh, article on, uh, and also did some presentations as well on uh, on A/B testing and the hiding snippets. Mm -hmm. um, because in this case, um, well, we can see the green line, so where basically the first paint, the first contour paint is happening, which uh, means where the user is able to see first content for the fir very first time, mm -hmm. and you obviously want to reduce this uh, well basically uh want to reduce the fcp because then you are also reducing the time of well looking at the white screen which um is important towards early user engagement and then bound conversion revenue etc mm -hmm. uh, so in this case um well yeah it's quite obvious also because of this cross at the start of the uh, line um, but it's quite obvious that it's a render blocking resource which is responsible for basically pushing back uh, the FCP metric. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is a uh, shame because, yeah, once again, the, the the style sheet is already done downloading over here, then scrolling down. It then has to be applied, obviously. So that's what we see over here, the purple uh, colored uh, flame chart. Mm -hmm. um, so we could s basically say that um, the browser could be able to already show contents around 1.8, 1 1.9 seconds, mm -hmm. but instead, it's being pushed back to well, three point, uh, well, three point something, which is a shame. It's mm -hmm. a real shame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to again interrupt you for ten seconds um, because. For again, folks who may or may not be familiar with web page test, um, for those familiar, this is just a, a little reminder. And for those who are new to the tool, um, something that uh, we us users, I guess, take for granted, but is a fantastic feature. Um, Erwin was sort of like scrubbing uh, the timeline uh, of the uh, waterfall, and that red line that was moving. Uh, across from left to right also aligns with the film strip that is right above it. So yep. what happens along that red line is aligned to the left-hand side of the film strip. So you can make these sort of visual connections as to what's going on, what resources are being loaded at that particular time in the timeline, which is, again, uh, you'll see at the top of the film strip the... Um, the time metrics, you know, so, um, you know, these are things that, again, we are very used to just sort of like playing back and forth, be like, okay, well, at uh, three point, somewhere between 3.5 and 3.6 seconds, the majority of my content showed up on my page. And then you can align that red line all the way down the waterfall and see exactly what was loaded, um, which resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, the investigative nature of the work, you know. Uh, I just wanted to mention that because, again, you know, we were sort of going back and forth. I wanted to make sure that people knew exactly what was happening. Um, you said something that really uh, sparked this um, sort of question in my head, but now I'm, I'm kind of forgetting, uh, <laughs> but it was just totally fine. Um, I will say this, you know, you'd mentioned like the fonts being loaded, whatnot. Uh, and obviously, you know, when you're done your uh, audit, you probably hand this over to, I'm assuming, like the team of developers and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you have at any point interactions with them during the audit do you, or do you do it all and then sort of submit it afterwards? Um, it, it also varies. Um, it depends on the um, complexity of, well, not maybe complexity, but... Um, we, we are all making decisions with, mm -hmm. well, basically the knowledge that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like developers are, um, well, breaking performance on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it does help me to know with what reasoning, um, yeah, some CSS or maybe critical CSS was in line, but uh, JavaScript still being render blocking, for example, or in this case, why both uh, FreeJS is being used, but at the same time also a jQuery apparently uh, which, well, is quite a shame, I would say. Um, and then, well, Moment.js, well, yeah, let's not get started about Moment.js, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Uh, so it then helps me to already have a first short meeting 
where mm -hmm. I'm then able to well get to know well, also the team, but also once again the reasoning behind some uh, choices, mm -hmm. uh, which then helps me to um, come up with more tailored recommendations, I guess, because yeah, I I could come up with a lot of recommendations, but I also know that within specific platforms it might be quite cumbersome to actually also implement them mm -hmm. so it doesn't really make sense to come up with recommendations within a specific platform that it's which is then hard to implement or not even doable to implement um, so yeah um, then also already engaging in a uh, well pre-meeting uh, might then help me to um, tailor the audit a bit more mm, got it got it understood um so before we we start to sort of uh wrap up i'd love to see an example of the deliverables that webperf consultants shares with the team um i mean uh, and that's a question that came from uh, mr dan Gale. um i mean that i guess that would be something uh that you might be able to uh provide uh maybe in that kind of a separate interaction maybe on twitter or on uh, linkedin or something of the sort um, but that would be interesting. Maybe we'll we'll have a, a separate talk about that. You know, uh, the sort of like uh, administrative end of of uh, sort of having a a, a sort of a consultation uh, and and what the, the deliverables are. So, um, Dan, that was a, a great question, actually. That to me is spawning another talk. Um, but what I was actually going to ask uh, before we sort of like wrap things up. Um, if you had to, if someone, you know, in, in a sort of like a pre-screening interview uh, or something of the sort and asked, you know, what are the top three uh, sort of mistakes in e -com specifically, unless, I mean, ideally, if they differ from uh, just a sort of like classic performance uh, audit, are there differences between the two and if they are what would be like say like the top three classic e-com issues and difference between which two i mean so i, I realize like e-commerce and just like general sort of like you know web apps or or sites uh they do have similarities you know without a doubt because they're both online and they're both trying to achieve uh mostly the same with some differences um but do you have particularly or do you think there are some issues uh, that are almost unique to e-commerce? Uh, if there are, what would be, say, like top three or like a couple? Well, yeah, unique. That, that's a difficult one because, uh, well, uh, performance consists of a lot of metrics, a lot mm -hmm. of nuances. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of combinations can be seen out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you know, there, there are, well, specific platforms which tend to use or in the past maybe tend to use, uh, um, yeah, tend to preload a lot of resources, which isn't always uh, necessary, not always needed. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, some interesting, let's once again share my screen for a moment. Yes, please. Because uh, next to, um, uh, yeah, ne next to lab data testing, synthetic testing, it also, also helps to have some uh, real user data, for example. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, what I'm often seeing is, um, well, not that often, uh, but whenever I, I see a change request like a CSS that is mm -hmm. then importing with using at import, importing another uh, mm -hmm. CSS, um, and let's see if I'm able to switch the dates. There we go. So this is the first control pane, mm -hmm. and this website was um, using Typekit, so basically Adobe Fonts. Correct. And um, they implemented type kit using at import and the type kit then did another at import. So you've got, mm. you then had a double change request mm -hmm. and I'm seeing it often in, well, more Lar Lar Laravel based solutions. Okay. Um, and sometimes also within Magento when plugins are being used and when a plugin builder vendor thinks that uh, a CSS needs to be embedded using at import. Mm -hmm. So it's then also, well, basically included in the head section with an additional at import. And uh, I, well, asked why they did it. And they, they told me it was part of a plugin and they didn't know, which obviously is a shame. Um, so yeah, some, such a thing happens over time, like we talked before about plugins, which could redo any performance optimizations, for example. Um, and in this case, it, um, I obviously expected a, um, 
a bigger improvement within unique page views because those are uncached. Mm -hmm. um, and on a successive page view, even the add import CSS can come from the cache, although there will still be a little delay. But uh, this actually is an improvement of uh, removing the double add import. And it came with a, well, 34% FCP improvement um, amongst unique page views. And the net difference is even bigger. So this is real use monitoring that I'm using on top of lab data testing whenever a collaboration starts. Um, and I'm then able to, well, I hope to be able to tell what the gains are on without the F time to first byte. So time to first byte, fluctuations excluded. The net difference, the net FCP win was actually around 42.7% at the 80th percentile, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but the interesting fact is, yeah, and it really depends on the type of bottleneck, but um, even when looking at, let's try doing so, even when looking at the 25th percentile, we still get to see a 33% um, FCP improvement. So basically, even the 25% fastest, fastest, well, experiences still have a massive FCP improvement, still saw a massive FCP improvement, uh, which isn't surprising. Um, I guess the degree really depends on the type of bottleneck. Some users might actually notice the difference and those on faster connections and better devices might not see any improvements, which uh, is the reason that uh, Google and Core Web Vitals is looking at the 75th percentile. Um, but um, yeah, that's one example. I'm not sure if I said another one. Uh, well, yeah, I had an interesting case myself on my very own website um, and let's go to Trio. I actually saw an increasement of visitors from India. And um, well, then we are talking about real user, uh, well, yeah, real user data mm -hmm. uh, once again. Um, because well, in India uh, or um, well, the, the type of devices or the internet speed isn't uh, the same as uh, in Europe, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so my website, although being a performance consultant, my website wasn't pass passing Core Web Vitals anymore in July 21. Mm -hmm. um, and I then looked at what happened and the amount of visitors from India just, uh, well, yeah, grew over time. Mm -hmm. And um, I basically, it was especially my blog posts, and I had to change the way my LCP image was being, uh, yeah, was being downloaded. Uh, mm -hmm. just, um, and that's also one of the challenges or typical mistakes I often see, especially within home pages, where the hero image is a background um, image. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it's basically being detected later on, or it's, it's being downloaded and then, uh, well, yeah, shown later on, mm -hmm. which also was part of uh, one earlier web page test sessions as well. So I guess I don't have to dive in. But um, um, yeah, those are also typical examples. And the same applies talking about LCP, also applies to image galleries, sliders on product pages, which are often hidden until the JavaScript is done downloading. Uh, and parsing and executing. So that would then result in a massive delay. Um, while, especially within server-side rendered solution, you could then yeah, basically already show the image, even if the JavaScript isn't there yet. Uh, because, well, the image is important for early user engagement and mm -hmm. the interactivity, well, that could come later in time, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, that, that was really interesting because I think people tend to forget that you know, users could come in uh, at any given moment from any particular particular part of the world. You know, um, I know that um, Bruce Lawson, longtime uh, sort of digital doyen, um, has uh, had a long time ago uh, given a talk at Velocity. Uh, and it turned into a blog post, actually, two blog posts, two parts, I believe. Uh, but it was titled The Wealthy Western Web, you know, kind of talking about um, how, um, you know, the Western Web uh, sort of, you know, doesn't develop for the world. You know, it's basically for its own surroundings. And, you know, what may look like a pretty good, you know, executing you know, site or whatever it may be, e-com um, site will suddenly not operate well in 
other markets, you know, and then it's upon making these kind of discoveries and investigations that you realize that, you know what, you could probably tweak a little bit more um, without sort of any, you know, sort of, uh, sort of, you know, challenges set to your site um, and, you know, look at potentially uh, more specific optimization so that, you know, not only will you have, you know, good performance in your immediate market, but other markets like India um, can also benefit from uh, these optimizations. I think he talked about um, an example uh, where uh, a business based out of New York um, had sort of failed in America, but uh, something happened in another part of the world and it just picked up and it, and it became very popular and they it essentially move their business to serve this area of the planet specifically, but they had to make some optimization uh, changes. But the fact is that they were able to remain a business because, you know, this being discovered by other parts of the world and making uh, the edits uh, at that point. And, I'm afraid uh, it even applies to your, well, sometimes to your primary audience, as in um, we might forget that, uh, well, once again, no user is the same. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not only the internet connection, but also to well share one more example. Mm -hmm. um, also, the, the um, yeah device memory, and especially mm -hmm. with the new metric. Um, so they are really doing a great job in coming up with uh, uh, well better metrics. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, the interaction to next pane, and it then really shows that the better the device is, um, the better the uh, IMP becomes as well, or basically responsiveness. Mm -hmm. The same applies to the first input delay as well. Although mm -hmm. the gap, yeah, is also quite um, well, relatively big, I guess. That's compare with the lowest value. Uh, so, for example, uh, those are only twenty-five page views, but this one is uh, what eight hundred and fifty percent worse than on the, when when well, basically visiting the website on with a uh, optimal device. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the interaction to next paint, it's five hundred and fifty-three percent, and they have. People, it makes sense that the um, uh, perceived, well, basically perceived performance, perceived loading experience should be okay, which you see visually, but the responsiveness has to be good as well. So once again, um, these are really great metrics that they, that Google came up with. Um, and I notice, which is quite a shame because I'm then involved too late, you could say, but I'm noticing that uh, people often pick a framework because they read about it being um, well, the blazing fast framework, for example, and once, yeah, once they want to go live, I've got such a, a case at the moment. They really want to make sure that the new environment is uh, well healthy when it comes to performance, healthy enough, mature enough. Um, but you can really see a difference between their, um, uh, well, yeah, I could call it legacy environment, server side rendered, mm -hmm. and the JavaScript version um, using React, mm -hmm. where the device memory is causing a bigger user experience gap mm -hmm. um, because, well, yeah, I, I guess they picked maybe a framework because of what they read online, being the mm -hmm. blazing fast framework, um, solving their challenges and issues. Um, but yeah, once again, no user is the same. And then you might um, yeah, learn too late in time that um, responsiveness is important as well. Yep, 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 absolutely. Uh, and, you know, that's, you know, luckily, um, with all the tools out there, and obviously with our pitch test, um, we, we try to um, let you take a snapshot of what is actually going on with your app, you know, and uh, so that you can start to make these uh, learned decisions into kind of seeing where the edits need to happen and, and, you know, what resources need to be sort of, you know, clipped. Uh, if if need be, uh, uh, but at the very least, um, understand you know when to serve what you know, and I think that's uh, primordial. Uh, getting back to the literacy, you know, and I talk this you know incessantly. I think performance literacy is super important, and hopefully, uh, web page test live is a platform where you can come in and and learn about stuff and see things, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that said, um, 
I, I do want to make a few mentions uh, before we do wrap this up. Uh, I know I talked about Perf Now. I think someone had asked, uh, any chance you'll be at Perf Now. Uh, are you going to Perf Now yourself? Yeah, I've been to the last one, which is way too long again ago, yeah. but um, I'm also going to uh, the, the upcoming one, yeah. Yeah, awesome. And and, and I think you were um, diligent to remind me that we met in 2019, I think, was yeah, it? Yeah, we did, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Um, you know, and this is, again, to share with the community that Perf Now is a fantastic event. Uh, I think it's something that, uh, especially in Europe, you know, I realize if you're in America traveling across uh, may be a bit of a of an ask, you know. So I the whole Google performance uh, Avengers is coming to Perth now as well. So yeah, I heard a, a few of them are showing up, you know. So uh, yeah. for anyone uh, who's interested again in Perth now, definitely go to perthnow.nl. Uh, pardon me, and you'll see on the information uh, you need to see there. Um, I think I mentioned that we are planning to do something the night before. So. If you do, uh, if you're interested in meeting some people from the WebPage Test team, it's going to be kind of like a meetup. I think you know we're going to have some fun, but in a sort of like performance uh, sense. Um, also, I just kind of want to recap um, a lot of things, uh, the few things that I mentioned earlier today. Um, of course, if you're ever interested in um, hearing and seeing uh, more of this content uh, that we're talking about. Uh, on your own, definitely um, get yourself a free account to start. Go to webpagetest.org and uh, get yourself started. Fuel up your user experience auditing, uh, and uh, you'll see exactly what we're talking about with regards to the metrics that we provide, the ability to deep dive. Uh, and we literally just scratched the surface, but um, we did spend a little bit of time looking at our... Um, uh, waterfall chart, which is uh, extremely detailed, you know, and uh, I'm willing to say um, like none other, uh, but, you know, I'm being a little biased. <laughs> but I, well, I, I, I yeah. <laughs> well, merci. Thank you. Um, and of course, um, this recording, um, well, this stream is recorded. Uh, as are all the other ones. So if you're interested in watching this over again or any of the previous ones, please, bomb means bit.ly slash channel dash W uh, webpage test. In fact, you know, if you um, go to YouTube and just, you know, search webpage test, uh, you'll see our channel there. Um, I mentioned as well earlier that uh, we are certainly taking submissions. If you in your, you know, sort of general uh, curiosity, you're looking at some sites, uh, looking for interesting findings, and you see something super duper interesting you'd like to share with the community, and us, obviously. Uh, if you go to bit.ly slash WPT dash submission, um, you'll see a form, and uh, we just ask you to sort of share the URL, um, and uh, tell us about the site. What was it about it that was like, pretty awesome or just generally could use some improvements. Uh, and uh, we're going to collect these and uh, do a stream about them and we'll shout you out as well. And uh, I think I mentioned the meetup uh, situation. Um, if you're, first of all, free August 2nd, um, the Toronto Web Performance Meetup is back up and running. bit.ly slash T-O-W-P dash AUG02. Uh, we have guests from uh, Builder.io, Builder pardon me, that's Steve, and uh, the Wix performance team as well. That is, uh, who do I have from Wix? Alon coming through. Uh, they've been doing some amazing work there. Um, I think that's all I wanted to mention in terms of uh, the earlier announcements. Um, Erwin, where can we find you? Um, well, yeah, it's in the screen already, but um, on uh, my website, erwinhoffman.com, or uh, I'm not really active on Link on, on Twitter, mm -hmm. but I'm active on uh, on LinkedIn. On the well, you know, if anyone wants to find him on Twitter, you can go to at blue to blonde. Yeah, I'm not going to ask what that means, but um, at the very least, you could tweet him, and he'll probably send you a link to his uh, LinkedIn, uh, where he is very active, by the way. Um, I mean, I know I tagged him on Twitter a few times, so I had to drag him out to my favorite platform. 
but uh, he is very active on Twitter. He does share resources on Twitter. Uh, Twitter. I'm LinkedIn. sorry. Yeah. Very <laughs> active on LinkedIn. I'm terribly so. sorry. Exactly. He's very active on LinkedIn, uh, shares resources on LinkedIn in his findings. So definitely check him out there. Um, if you have any questions for myself, my name is Henri. You could always find me on Twitter where I'm mostly active. Henri Elvetica. Um, and i um, happy to share some of my resources. But of course, uh, you'll absolutely want to follow at Real Web Page Test. Um, as um, the fall comes, we are going to be doing quite a bit. Um, and we'll be updating uh, or sending people updates and the information on Twitter. Certainly, we're actually on LinkedIn as well, believe it or not. And um, But yeah. I mean, that's super duper important. And again, I get back to that uh, topic that I discussed, which was um, getting the meetup ecosystem back up and running. We're very uh, supportive of the case. So if you're in any part of the world and you're trying to get a meetup up and running or resurrected, please let us know. Uh, this is something that we'll be doing um, certainly uh, um, fall moving forward uh, because uh, it is a very important um, sort of uh, resource to uh, our ecosystem, and and I get back to the fact that you know London Web Perf, amazing, you know San Francisco, uh, Toronto, like there are so many that I've attended that were uh, very much part of my uh, my little come up. Um, I think that's all we wanted to share. Is there anything else you wanted to share before we sort of close out, Erwin? Like the I've stage is yours. Lot, I've got a lot to share, but um, I, I guess we have to wrap up. Yeah, maybe some oh. other time. Yeah, oh, I'm not oh, done with web page tests. Awesome, awesome. And again, um, folks, if you didn't hear, Erwin is going to be at uh, Perf now. So that's going to be awesome. I'm going to be there myself as well. And uh, moving forward, we're going to talk about that uh, uh, as uh, time progresses, because I think it's at the end of October. So you'll hear a few more yep. conversations from us uh, with regard to that. And I think that's it. Erwin, merci. Thank you very much. Thanks for spending Thank some you. time with us. Uh, that was very insightful. Once again, folks, the video is going to be edited and put back up on the uh, um, our YouTube channel, and so you'll be able to watch it again.